The following message contains a special offer for listeners of this station. Are you a man over 40? Are you constantly looking for the nearest bathroom? Do you wake up multiple times a night to use the bathroom? Right now, Perfect Prostate is sending out free bottles of their groundbreaking new formula to listeners of this station. Perfect Prostate formula was developed by medical doctor Mitchell Fleischer, and its ingredients have been clinically studied to reduce your frequent nighttime bathroom visits and promote healthy urine flow. Right now, preferred customers get their first bottle of Perfect Prostate absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. Perfect Prostate is guaranteed to reduce that constant urge to use the bathroom, especially at night, and promote healthy urine flow. Don't wait. Call now for your free bottle. Just pay shipping and processing. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Supplies are limited. One free bottle per household. Call now. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Every day, the men and women of the United States Marine Corps Stand ready to defend the American way of life. The few, the proud, the Marines. Hey folks, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Dr. Richard Harden. We are on the same mission, which is Waking Up America. We just have different paths. So stay tuned for some information on how you can keep up with Richard and all his work. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Having a place to go after school will make you a better student. Having an outlet to express yourself will make you a better artist. Having something to do together will make you a better family. At The Y, we're helping build better friends, listeners, writers, swimmers, scientists, and musicians one chance at a time. Get the gift of opportunity. Support The Y at YMCA.net. The Y for a better us. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. 
We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel... And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. I'm not ready to end the fight. I'm not ready to back down. Because I've been through hell and I don't have time to go round and round and round. It's too late to turn back now. You know I wouldn't if I could. Because I'm proud as hell. I can't bring myself to do what it is you think I should. All right, folks. Well, happy, what is this now, Thursday? I'm losing track of the days. We've crammed so much in over the last few weeks because of the elections. Yep, 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 that's right. It is Thursday, November the 10th, 2016, and it is the night before Veterans Day, so I want to take a moment, since I won't be live with anybody till tomorrow night again, to remind everybody to thank a veteran tomorrow, spend some time contemplating the folks that have fought, bled, and died for this country while we're watching a bunch of ingracious liberals terrorize their own towns because they're on suicide watch because of who won the presidency this is jen and rick i am rick she is jen good evening ma'am how are you i'm doing really well uh i think maybe better than i anticipated at this point um i i have i have to say there's something incredibly gratifying about watching the absolute destruction meltdown just free fall of the left and of the media it it has been entertaining it has been quite funny also quite sad but just i mean this is this is crazy this is insane i mean we none of us thought we'd be here <laughs> All I have to say, and it's interesting because I have a friend, um, and you may know him from uh, your time hanging out with us uh, back when we were with K98 Talk and we had a lot of the folks that aren't doing shows with us now. Uh, Captain Morgan, otherwise known as Bill Morgan, is now involved in a project called the 12th Fleet. And it's kind of a hush-hush kind of thing. Once it gets situated, he's going to come on every so often and try to let folks know exactly what their plans are. But he sent me a, uh, a blog post the other day where he actually mentioned the new radio station, so I wanted to share it because he'd actually gotten a chance to kind of work it in there. And the title of the article was May You Live in Interesting Times. I'm like, if that is not fitting. And he wasn't even talking about the elections, but then we're watching all this stuff. And, you know, and, and here's the thing, folks. Look, you heard us, if you listened to America Off the Rails last night, now back in its lifetime slot, Sunday through Thursday at 11 Eastern 10 Central. You heard us last night doing the roundtable of mea culpa because almost everybody that's prominent in this station that does live broadcasting, we got it wrong. We freely admit we got it wrong. We didn't want Trump. Most of us didn't. We were, we were lobbying hard against him. We didn't want Hillary either, but we didn't want Trump. And even I myself, even though all 77 counties in Oklahoma again went red, 5% of us voted Libertarian. So thank God I can actually say I am no longer a Republican because I still do not like a lot of the things that the party has done over the last couple of years. So I actually, for the moment, have a home, even if they don't really want me either, while I work with some other folks to try to build a new one. Uh, speaking of which, I want to plug something real quick, because one of the founding members of the Federalist Coalition is going to be on with Dan and I tomorrow night on Robinson and Wright. Uh, that is, of course, at 11 Eastern, so I do encourage you to tune in and check that out. Now, as far as today... Yeah, and then I'll let Jen have some time, because I feel like I've already been talking for like 20 minutes. It's only been five. Um... As far as today, I honestly, over the last couple of days, have finally started to feel, I don't know, a bit of a healing, if nothing else, for my, but for myself, because I realized that no matter how much I didn't want Donald Trump to be president, and no matter how much I wanted something that I thought could have been better for the country, we're stuck with what we got. He's going to be president regardless, 
And at this point, he hasn't even been sworn in yet, and people are already calling him the Antichrist. I don't know what he's going to do. I have a very good idea that we're, that nobody's probably going to be 100% happy with anything that he does. I don't think anybody from one extreme to the other is going to get a lot of the things that they wanted from him. And I have to admit, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if he took a really sharp, hard left turn after he gets sworn in. But he hasn't even been sworn in yet. So all I'm saying is, he is currently president-elect. He has, as of yet, done nothing at all to harm the country. And let's at least give him the same benefit of the doubt that a lot of us conservatives tried to give Obama until he proved to us that we couldn't any longer. Is that really that much to ask? Right. And I think that uh, it's been I, I think that a lot of people in positions of power have done a pretty good job of conveying that similar message um, that, you know, Obama did. Senator Warren did. Uh, Hillary herself did, which I thought her speech was really rather good. Um, you know, there was a little bit of the sexist type thing brought into it, but mostly it was really pretty good. Uh, and I felt definitely like it was the most connected she's ever been. She was very emotional, which it was nice to see she's not just some robot. But um, I think a lot of people have done a good job of saying the right thing. And I don't really care if they mean it or not. That's what they're projecting to the public, which is what's important. And I've found it funny that there are people that are really mad about that. Uh, the left is in such a, uh, a free fall, in such a breakdown mode that there are people that are very upset with Elizabeth Warren, with President Obama for offering the olive branch, for saying that we need to come together, that we need to, um, you know, respect the office and to uh, give this administration our open hearts and minds and support. Um, they're actually saying that they should be representing, that, th that they're doing a disservice to all of their people that are protesting in the streets, which I'd like to get to in a little bit. But, um, and I find that so sad. That's so sad and also so incredibly hypocritical. What was said to us in 08 and 12? Get over it. The election's over. It's done. The people have spoken. You know, get over it. Um, and so I find it awful that very prominent journalists and uh, other Democratic representatives are uh, actually giving them crap for, for saying any of that. And, uh, that, that tells you a lot about who's about the divisiveness and, uh, that it's not just on the right, like the media and liberals like to portray that the left is very hateful, uh, towards the right and particularly towards Donald Trump. I mean, I guess my whole thing with all that is, you know, I mean, we're seriously watching people that are the first ones. And at this at this point, I, I'm going to kind of take shots at everybody again, because we're seriously watching people that hang on just a second. I just... OK, so sorry, I actually somebody that I haven't spoken to in forever all of a sudden decided to start trying to message me on Facebook. So back to what I was saying a moment ago. Um, and it, again, this is going to be a shot at, at both both sides of the, the house right now, because because I heard something today that really, really just annoyed me. And again, it's just it's one of those things where I'm looking at this going, when is somebody that is involved in this going to stand up and be an adult in the room? Because I remember in 2008, when the story came out about Barack Obama having his closed door meeting with the Republicans who went in there hat in hand and tried to work with him. And he basically, and this is the story. I don't know if it actually happened the way it was portrayed to me, but this was the story. And it actually made the rounds through a lot of the talking heads. Barack Obama apparently stuck his, put his feet up on the desk, put his hands behind his neck and said, elections have consequences. I won. Deal with it. Now, Everyone involved in conservative media at that point was lambasting him for this and saying that even the people that win are still supposed to try to work with the other side, especially when they say that's what they are going to do. Now, let's not forget that is exactly the same thing that Trump has said time and time again, that he's going to find a way to be all of America's president because that's what he feels he needs to do. But today... I heard Rush Limbaugh live on the air say the exact same things word for word that he was lambasting 
Obama for saying in 2008. We won. Elections have consequences. We don't have to reach out to these people. We own them. We can destroy them. Those were his words. When is someone, I don't care which side of the argument you're on anymore, when is somebody going to stand up and be a damn adult? We have the folks that are the prominent folks on the right that are basically saying, screw it, stick it to them. We've got people rioting in the streets on the left. We've got people on both sides beating the crap out of people, pulling hijabs off of other people's heads. I mean, what the hell has happened to America? And we're all sitting here watching it, and some of us are just sitting back going, I don't even recognize this country anymore. And I thought maybe once the election was over, we could actually maybe start trying to heal again. But I'm really starting to think it's just never going to happen. Because nobody is willing to stand up and be an adult. Nobody is willing to say, look, at this point, he is our president, or he will be, and we need to at least give him a chance to try to be president before we condemn him. Because Well, here's my deal. In in all reality, I, I've been sad. I've been mad. I have not wanted Donald Trump to be the Republican Party's nominee. I did not want him uh, in the Oval Office. But... Here's the thing that I realized over the last couple of days, and I talked about this um, uh, kind of at length in a rant on Twitter yesterday, but um, this change is nothing for me, really. I, I intended, when I thought it would be Hillary, when I thought that she would be in the White House, I intended to work to fight her on big government progressive policies. Um, I expected to, you know, go to bat. Uh, for conservatism, I expected to work on rebuilding conservative, like the conservative movement. And uh, if that means a new party or whatever it means. So these are things I intended to do anyways, excuse me. But that doesn't change with Donald Trump going into office. All that really changes about that, that makes it a little bit different is that uh, we do have a Republican held Congress and a Republican POTUS. And if Congress does its job, and, and he doesn't go too off the rails, um, then we should be able to get some things through that we've been working towards for a very long time. And that's a positive. Um, but other than that, I, I always support America. I always respect the office, no matter who's in it. And I always fight for conservatives. My ideals, my uh, the ideology behind conservatism, I think is a winning one. And I try to espouse it in my everyday life. And those are my values. Those are my principles um, that that do not change. And n- nothing about this changes that and what I am willing to work for and uh, and what I'm what I'm going to support and what I'm going to speak out against. So that's all it is, is that it's just a different big government New York liberal in the office that may or may not uh, be reined in by a by a Republican Congress. We don't really know. And I don't really know what his policies are. And we we have a small idea of what he said he's going to do, but it, he changes his mind all the time. So um, all I can do, I, I do not, um, I do not, be, I do not believe and trust in politicians. I believe and trust in our system and I believe and trust in uh, conservatism. And so that's what I'll continue to do. Exactly. And that's what we should do because I mean, that's, that's the whole, that's been the whole argument of the folks that were both never Trump and never Hillary. I mean, at this point, I can't legitimately say that I'm never Trump anymore. I guess I should have said never Trump unless he gets elected. Because, I mean, I've got to give him a shot because he's going to be the president. Uh, I mean, and and I think a lot of folks are still looking at it like never Trump means never Trump, so now I'm not going to support him at all. I'm I'm sorry, I can't do that. Not until he proves to me that I can't. Because, look... What, the the election is the the primary was one thing the general was another but now he is going to be sworn in as an American I feel I must at least attempt to support my president otherwise I'm just as bad as these people that are rioting in the streets I'm just doing it a different right. way that that upsets right. me you know I was speaking to someone today and I'm I'm gonna have them remain nameless because they didn't realize I was gonna be talking about them on the air. But I was speaking to someone today, and they actually told me that it was in regards to a Facebook post that I put up a few days ago where I specifically said these very same things that I'm saying right now. Whether you voted for Donald Trump or not, he is about to be president-elect of the, he is a president-elect of the United States and is about to be the 45th president. No one fought harder to try to keep Donald Trump from this position than I did. But there comes a time when we have to set differences aside. 
the derisiveness must end because he is going to be the president of the United States. May God keep both president-elect Donald Trump and our future first family safe. And I have been catching nine kinds of hell over that simple Facebook post from both liberals and some conservatives alike. And then some other folks are liking it and cheering me on and thanking me for even though they knew how hard I fought against him that I'm willing to try to get behind him. But something that really just kind of shook me to my core today was someone that I know, that I know personally, that I've known for a few years, who told me specifically that they in no uncertain terms could support anyone as crazy as Donald Trump. And for me to tell them that they had to was just asinine because their grandfather walked up to President Gerald Ford and called him a jackass. So if they can do that, then they can speak out against Trump. Which is fine. If that's what you want to do and you think that's going to accomplish anything, then by all means, please do just that. But all I'm saying at this point is, to me, this is no different than when Obama gave his speech. I was terrified the night that I found out Obama won the White House. I was watching in horror as county after county after county turned blue because I knew what we were looking for, what looking at. And this is the point that I've been trying to make all day to all of you milk toast millennials that are having your classes canceled pizza delivered counselors come into your your college classrooms and the huffington post putting a freaking article out about how to deal with the election with a suicide hotline number at the bottom of it look life is not fair that's one of the things that we've been trying to tell you now for the last eight years and i know some people that are about the age where they have seen what they thought was going to be a perpetual shift to the left for the last eight years. But the same thing that happens always happens. When the pendulum swings too far, it starts going back the other direction. And unfortunately, eventually it means it will go too far our way. But that is just the way things go. And to think that just because the president that you wanted didn't get the White House, that now you have the right to go destroy other people's property, that you have the right to keep other people that were there paying to learn from having the ability to learn in class today because your feelings are hurt, because who won the election of the United States, you can all kiss my ass. I am so done dealing with this. I would say I would take that even further and say if you need uh, if you I I saw something where it was like people need insurance for uh, the trauma counseling because of this election. If you need insurance for trauma counseling, if you need trauma counseling because of an election, you need insurance for a whole lot of other reasons because you have psychological issues. If you are having a mental breakdown over this election, you seriously need to seek help. And I say that in all seriousness. There is something very wrong with that. You may need to be on some sort of stabilizer, some anti-anxiety meds. I mean, go talk to a doctor. Don't just go see someone who's going to make, like, go talk to a psychiatrist. Talk to your general practitioner because this is not healthy. This is not a normal reaction. You know, I, I, this whole protesting just makes me insane. Do they not think, like you said, that we were not also, you know, upset anxious, fearful about a man that we had so little in common with and seemed adverse to all of our ideals and values. I mean, we did. We were all afraid. We were told that he was going to, you know, completely upend Christianity, that he was going to take away so many Christian rights, that he was going to do this, he was going to do that, he was going to force churches, he was going to, I mean, there were all sorts of things, I mean, that he was going to do. And thankfully, we did have a Republican Congress and a lot of those things that I don't know if he would have or not, that didn't happen. And that's also something Congress doesn't get credit for is all the things that they made sure didn't pass that were on the Obama administration's agenda. But, uh, you know, to go to the streets, to harass people, to burn stuff, to incite violence. And I had a lot of people on my TL today saying these are peaceful protests. I'm sorry. No, I linked at least two dozen articles of different incidences of actual violence um, of burning Trump in effigy. Can you imagine if we'd burned Obama? If we'd burned Obama, people would be arrested in droves. The left would be crying like it was nobody's business. Um, And, you know, I'm sorry, but grow up and deal with the disappointment, deal with the consequences of choosing a corrupt establishment candidate that no one liked or trusted and deal with the repercussions of eight years of Obama presidency and a hard push of the leftist and social justice agenda backfiring. Deal with it because that's where we are. 
And to ignore that is actually extremely, it's, it's ignorant at best. It's willfully, you know, intellectually dishonest at worst. I think that, um, you know, they're just so mad about the electoral college and they're, I, they're yelling on the TV, like one vote should equal one vote. I mean, they don't understand this Republic. They fundamentally misunderstand everything, which should dis- discredit pretty much everything they're saying. I mean, you are sitting here talking about how, uh, they're sitting there talking about the white rural people in such a condescending way and how uneducated and ignorant they are. And those are the voters that elected Trump. Well, they absolutely don't even understand our government process at all. They don't even understand the election process. They don't even understand the electoral college. This is exactly what it's supposed to protect against is the rule of, of a, a mob rule, basically. So if their objective is to ignore or overturn the legal democratic results of the election process, then you're calling for a coup that's a treasonous act and you wish to put this republic at risk and that's incredibly dangerous and unforgivable to me. Well, I'm going to go a step further because I want to remind some people, some people that are all up in arms now about President Trump. Some of the things that we've gone through under President Obama, um, race relations being set back to pre-1960, foreign policy in a lot of ways being set back back to pre-1960, an Iran deal that puts us perilously close to having a crazy regime have access to nuclear weapons, no matter what they try to tell us, an over completely overcompensating and overrun EPA, very, very stagnant job growth for the last eight years. People keep putting up all these numbers, supposedly comparing him to Reagan when we've barely broken 3% GDP in the last eight years. I think we may have just finally gotten there. And that is almost a zero-sum game. 3% three GDP means we're breaking even. That's not a good number. If it's any lower than that, it means we're technically losing money for everything that we're supposedly producing. That's what those numbers mean. So to have us go through all of that and to watch the targeting through the IRS, the executive orders, and all of the other things that we've watched, and the right has patiently sat and waited for our turn to vote again. And to do that, and to know that at least 70% of the people on the right would have tried to line up behind Hillary Clinton and give her the benefit of the doubt if she was the one that won the presidency. We wouldn't have been happy about it. We would have been pissed as hell, but we would have done it because it's what we do because we're Americans. And to have, and to have people continue to shove in my face the fact that they're not going to support Donald Trump because they didn't vote for him. Look, I didn't vote for President Obama, but I still tried to support him until I, re- until I realized that I couldn't because the things that he was doing were insane. I still would have tried to support Hillary Clinton until such time as she either wound up in prison or did something completely stupid like left people to die again. But I still would have tried to do it because I'm an American. There comes a time when you have to put your country first. And that's what that's what astounds me is because I've been listening to the, the press conferences held by um, Josh earnestly over the, la- over the last couple of days. Or Josh Ernest, what the hell is his actual name? Because people make fun of his name all the time, so I always get it confused. But anyway, the White House press secretary, and he kept saying over and over again, President Obama understands that the American people pick his successor, not him. He's not happy about the results either, but he has to put the country first. If you're hearing somebody like Obama say that, and people are out burning things and breaking crap, are you kidding me right now? Yeah, I, they, they've just resulted to being petulant children. It, it really is quite astonishing. And uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the me- when we come back, like talk a little bit about the media's role in all this and if they are, if they will or will not claim responsibility. Uh, yeah, actually, I think you linked me an article about that earlier. So I figured we were going to talk about it after the break. Speaking of which, it's about that time, folks. We have got to pay some bills when we come back. The bottom half of the Jen and Rick show and the continuation of Suicide Watch 2016. This is what happens when liberals do not get what they want. We'll be right back. <laughs> and so, and my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way... You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. 
It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Freedom is never more than one generation. All right, folks, we are back. All right, so when we come, when, now that we're back, I said almost said when we come back, we're actually going to change gears here in just a second, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the media, whether they're going to hold each other accountable, what's going on with the pollsters and the pundits and everybody else. But I, ha- I have a bit of a, a statement, and then I'm, then I'm going to move on and pass the, the vitriol. But, you know, I have a friend of mine on Facebook that just posted something that kind of resonated with me because even he just pointed out that if Barack Obama and Donald Trump could actually get along today, why can't we? Why are there people rioting in the streets? Why are there people on the other side of the aisle that are suddenly all of a sudden targeting people with hijabs, ripping them off their heads, doing all these crazy things that we're seeing start popping up all over social media? Not to sound like Rodney King, but can't we all just get along? Because, look, I got to tell you, I was half expecting, I really was, I was half expecting Donald Trump to walk into the Oval Office, 
grab President Obama, buy his collar and his mom jeans, and toss him out on his ass. He didn't do it. So if they can get along, why can't we? That's my question. Can we just put all the anger aside for a second and remember that we are Americans first, please? Maybe? Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Well, right. I think... Go ahead. I, I think where... Um, so you have, like, a next election night happens, right? And as this is obvious that uh, it was not quite what they thought it would be, um, things started to go really downhill on networks like CNN and MSNBC. And as the night went on and it looked like there was practically no path for her to win, uh, things bro broke down even further. And you had um, people already tweeting stuff. You have um, Van Jones going on and saying that this is a white lash um, and uh, people emphasizing that white people, white people, white people, rural people, uneducated, ignorant people, you know, I, and, and the thing that part of this with the media that I, I really am starting to think that they don't realize that whites are still the majority in the United States. I mean, this is what it is. They're throwing tantrums over white people voting in pretty large numbers. White people vote in a fairly large number compared to other demographics. That's just the fact of the matter. Um, but even still, they are the, still the majority in the United States. And, and they, uh, both candidates, their majority of the votes cast for them were by whites from both candidates. So what's the difference between whether it's him or her, whichever on one it was that won? White males. So it doesn't really make any sense to be, you know, this is not controversial. This is not a conspiracy. And I don't understand why it's being treated like it is. Um, in addition, I think that they are um, most of the most of the media has been su supremely smug. Um, they have been, you know, wringing their uh, their hands and screaming at this guy and practically I mean, they're choking up on national TV, on live TV. They're choking up and barely able to talk. They're so upset about this. And, uh, you know, all I have to say is, uh, first of all, I think we overestimated women. We overestimated the unity of the Democratic Party. And for me personally, I think I overestimated the Clintons and this entire Clinton machine we've been told is so unstoppable and uh, that it, it is what's going to happen. And, you know, the media is the one that pushed all this. The Democratic Party set it up so that Clinton couldn't lose. She had to win the nomination. The media was more than glad to embrace that for the most part. Um, but then they pushed for Trump so that she could beat him. They laughed, they mocked his candidacy in the primary, and then they rejoiced in his nomination. And it backfired big time. Sally Cohn is tweeting, also a factor. The media gave Trump four to five times more coverage than Hillary. Free airtime for his smears and lies. I'm laughing. I'm going, you did this. You made this. The media ha bears a lot of responsibility in all of this. Now, the Democratic Party it owns responsibility for putting up such an awful candidate. Um, they thought that her just being um, a woman would get her by, I think, and having the name Clinton. Uh, and, it, and it didn't. So I feel like people were shocked and totally unprepared for her to lose. And that specifically is means the media. And so... Today, I'm kind of going through some things, and I found a couple people that are that you know posted some really interesting stuff. And one of them um, is I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but his name is Oliver Campbell, and uh, he basically had been saying for a very long time that uh, the media was blowing this, uh, that they were not paying attention. They were not listening to the people. They were not talking to people and asking the right questions. And uh, that and that the media sold the American people a bill of racist goods and uh, the, that the people bought it, hook, or the liberals bought it hook, line and sinker. And uh, they kept pushing it. They kept saying it. And as long as you continue to beat up on people and tell them they're racist, sexist, you know, misogynist, all of these different things, uh, the more everyday regular people that may agree with someone on certain viewpoints is going to reject that. You just beat them over the head with it. And he kept saying for a while that, like, the media has to, you know, own their part in this and the responsibility that they have. 
which then he put out this other column. Um, he tweeted out this column that I then read that I thought was really interesting, too. And it's by Will Ron over at CBS News. And the title is Commentary, The Unbearable Smugness of the Press. And basically, he goes on to saying that that, that the press himself included, you know, spent months mocking the people uh, that had a better sense of what was going on. People that were saying that um, Trump had a good possibility to win. People like uh, Selena Zito, um, who was really on the ground the whole time covering different aspects of of uh, Trump support, Trump rallies and Trump's campaigns. And she was, un, you know, pretty much unwavering in her belief that he was going to take this um, and pretty handily. Um, and that he and that the media has just ha- held such contempt for their audience. And so they've become utterly untrustworthy, incredibly biased, and they don't think that they are and they don't care, even if they do know they are. And how this is such a problem and that this is such a uh, a disservice to the American people and also part of why they soundly rejected them, why they embraced someone who mocked them relentlessly. They fell in love with it and there's no denying it. And love teased them and dragged them on. I mean, they loved it. Um, so... I think that they bear a lot more responsibility than they want to. And uh, so he had posed, you know, a, a few things. And, and this, I'll just read the end of it of how he kind of um, wrapped it up. He says, as a direct, you know, basically he talks about calling them all these things and living in the, living in the bubble and, and, and reinforcing that even if they get it wrong, that it's not really them that's wrong, the voters are wrong and they need to still keep hacking away at whatever. And this sounds so familiar to those of us that are conservatives because it's what we know of, of how liberals operate in general, um, that it leads to more smugness, more meanness, more certainty from reporters and pundits. Faced with defeat, we retreat further into our bubble, assumptions left unchecked. No, it's the voters who are wrong. As a direct result, we get it wrong with greater frequency. Out on the road, we forget to ask the right questions. We can't even imagine the right question. We go into assignments too certain that we fi- that what we find will serve to justify our biases. The public's estimation of the press declines even further. Fewer than one in three Americans trust the press, which starts the cycle anew. There's a place for opinionated journalism. In fact, it's vital. But our casual profession-wide smugness and protestations of superiority are making us unable to do it well. Our theme now should be humility. We must be more impartial, not less so. We have to abandon our easy culture of tantrums and recrimination. We have to stop writing these know-it-all 140-character sermons on social media and admit that, as a class, journalists have a shamefully limited understanding of the country that we cover. Bingo! That's what this election proves. They had no idea. They were left completely shocked. And they can learn from it. And uh, the liberals and Democrats can learn from it. And and possibly be able to reach some of these voters that they lost. There was so much crossover of voters that voted for Obama twice that now voted for Trump very solidly in this election, particularly among blue collar union workers that feel completely abandoned by the Democratic Party. And so they can look at this and they can learn from it and they can try to move forward or and possibly gain seats and possibly win again. Or they can continue to ignore it. They can continue to call people racist and sexist and homophobic and all of these things and uh, completely disregard their values and their lifestyles. And they can continue to lose and we will have more Donald Trumps. Can we please not have any more Donald Trumps? Uh, right? I mean, it doesn't exactly have to be him, but you, that kind of person. But I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, people that will... Uh, that aren't afraid to tell them, no, screw you. And when they're sitting there at his rallies, he goes, oh, well, don't worry. Don't mind them. They're just the press. They're going to lie about it anyways. I mean, that kind of stuff, right? That was some of the least offensive things that he said and did. And those are things that very well resonated with people. Um, I know it resonated with his supporters, but it resonated with even people that weren't his supporters. And he got so many votes from people that weren't huge fans of his, but that, absolutely believed uh, uh enjoyed how he was you know kind of doing some of the things he was doing 
and absolutely believed that, you know, yeah, I am fed up. I am sick of being treated this way. I am being sick of called names. And uh, it's time to push back and it's time to stand up to that. And here's a guy that is not afraid to say it at all. And even if I don't really like everything he has to say, I'm going to go with that, especially over someone that's a lying liar who lies like Hillary Clinton. You know, and, and that was my thing in the beginning. And, and I've told folks this in the, in the very beginning of him announcing, <laughs> I actually seriously almost bought a ticket to the Trump train because I loved watching him come out and just own the media and own everybody else on the stage. But then I realized he doesn't really have an off switch. And then I started being terrified about what he was going to do in closed door meetings with other countries and what's going to happen the first time somebody insults him and he just can't handle it. And that's been one of the reasons why, even though I'm still doing my best to give him the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to say something that someone else put very well yesterday. I am still... I have always been never a Hillary. So the fact that she was defeated last night, and this was something that I read yesterday, has me elated. I am unashamedly also fairly happy that we have retained the House and the Senate. I oh, I'm so excited. That's the best outcome of all of this. And I sincerely hope that my never Trump side was wrong. I don't remember who it was that tweeted that yesterday, and it was a bit of a paraphrase, but it summed up everything that I was feeling yesterday because we really... When those first few numbers started coming in and all the different pollsters who got it wrong, which it's kind of funny because I actually saw a pollster say something on and I was trying to find the audio and I couldn't do it in time. He actually because, you know, they'll usually talk about having egg on their face. And this dude was like, I don't just have egg on my face at this point. I'm wearing the entire omelet. I just right. I just right. thought that was that was a pretty good admission of we just we didn't see this one coming. But let me explain to those of you that are try, trying to figure out how they got it so wrong. Let me explain a couple things to you. They only always poll likely voters. So for those of you who may not know what likely voters means, that means they have to have voted in the last three out of four elections. They still, for the most part, only unless it's online, which they don't count those. They still only vote people or still only poll people with landlines. Even though now most cell numbers are listed, if you haven't noticed yet, you're probably just like me. You get about 40 million telemarketer calls a day on your cell phone now because those numbers are officially listed somewhere and people are able to find them. Um, and they don't track first-time registered voters very well. And that's where, even in my state this year, they just tracked it. We had 68% turnout. 68% in... Even in, a, even in a presidential election is an astounding turnout for Oklahoma. That means there were only 30, what, 42% that stayed home? Even in 2008, our turnout wasn't anywhere near that good. And, right. that, and that's right. the thing. That, that's one of the reasons why Hillary lost. Because if you'll notice, things were a lot different this time in the other direction. We had a higher turnout in flyover country and a lower turnout in the cities because nobody really wanted to vote for either one of them. But flyover country was tired of President Obama's policies. We have been since they were in, since they were conceived. We didn't want Obamacare. It was shoved down our throats anyway. We kept sending people to Congress because they kept telling us they were going to repeal it when they couldn't ever really manage to get it done anyway, which that's not necessarily their fault either but it, it's just one of those things where obamacare was was the beginning of the impetus of the destruction of the obama legacy because it didn't do anything that he said it was going to do in the way that he said it was going to do it and it gets worse every year now i don't know what donald trump is going to do about obamacare and that's another reason why i didn't really want him where he is now anyway because i took him at his word in a 2015 cbs 60 minutes interview when he said that he's going to invest in some form of single payer, even if it's just for the poor folks in the country. I have a problem with that because once we start policies like that, they never stop. And that's the other problem with Obamacare. It wasn't designed to make things better. That's why it's imploding. That's why it's blowing up right in front of our eyes because their whole plan was to take out the insurance industry and put somebody like Hillary in place that could continue it and step in and make everything single payer. I've been saying this for eight years, even before I, not actually not, almost nine years, because I knew it was coming. This was the framework. Right. It's like when you build a house. You can't right. just throw the house out. You got to build the frame first. 
The, right. AC, the ACA was the framework to transition us to a single payer system. And I Absolutely. Don't, and I don't think that either under Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, there's a sufficient enough reason to think that we're going to get fully away from it because even he's using language like repeal and replace. And I think in in some ways that there I, there's a lot more, um, I guess, kind of heart for it in the uh, Republican uh, Congress than I think we, we've ever known. I mean, I think you kind of get used to something like this. It's already there. People don't feel like they can absolutely just abolish laws, which is insane. It's why we are where we are. It's because we won't just abolish crap. It's why our our um, our you know, everything is so bloated and departments are just uncontrollably large with outrageous spending is because we won't abolish things that should be, um, you know, the bureaucracy is out of control. So I don't think that they're going to cut it out completely. I think that uh, they'll do something different. And like you said, single pair, but, um, but I don't know for sure that there are enough that will go with it. Um, but I do, I do know that what happens with a Republican Congress, and I think that this is to um, the chagrin of the conservatives and Republican voters, but also is actually, you know, to the credit of them as statesmen, is that uh, much more often than Democrats and especially liberal Democrats in the Senate and in the House, uh, Republicans do feel a sense of duty that when they're there, that they should have some sort of compromise, that they should uh, try to do some things in some bipartisan fashion. And uh, they do get kind of guilt tripped into some stuff. And I think that they care about their colleagues and they care about their constituents and they care about the American people. And uh, they're not as vindictive sometimes as I don't want them to be uh, on a lot of fronts. But when it comes to that, it's like it's our Congress and this is something that's costing the tax taxpayers money and it's absolutely against the republican party flat platform then they shouldn't feel guilty about taking that away but they do so uh i mean they always have reached across the aisle more than the dems have to them the dems have said we're reaching across by telling you that you have to give in to what we're asking they're not they're not reaching across saying we'll give you this concession so that's but that is what republicans do and i think they're right to do it in the long run for, uh, you know, kind of the um, just how how everything should be in Congress and how uh, you should work together and with the administrations. But it's it's very idealistic and a little um, a little utopian feeling. And it's why people get really frustrated with them, I think. And no, exactly. And, you know, I, that that to me is the whole thing, you know, because, you know, I mentioned Rush Limbaugh sounding a lot like Barack Obama in 2009 or 2000. Well, I guess it was actually 2009 because he wasn't inaugurated till then. But anyway, um, the whole thing about it is all I'm saying at this point is somebody needs to realize that if we're actually going to try to reach across the aisle, we can't do it while we're trying to backhand people. And I'm not saying come to them on their own terms. I'm saying give them the opportunity to at least make suggestions and then tell them no, that's not that's not something that we're going to do. There are ways, and, he, and it's totally fine to stand your ground and say no. This is not part of the conversation. This is not what we're willing to compromise on. That's okay. But they should be willing to to have the discussion in the first place. And like I said, Republicans do it more often than Democrats do, which is why their constituents get so annoyed with them because like, they just give in to the Democrats. But I don't think that just turning it on them and saying turnabout's fair play and just sticking it to them is the right answer either because I don't like that. I like to be consistent. I'd like to not be hypocritical. And I've seen so much hypocrisy on the right this election, and I've seen so a lot on the left is obviously – being demonstrated right now specifically in the streets where they're all love trump's hate and you know everybody should get along blah blah blah. now they're there and they're literally beating people um so i i hate the hypocrisy of it so i don't want to see that happen in congress i want to see them be productive effective and um and i want to change hearts and minds and you don't do that by bullying people and by being jerks about anything 
Well, you know, I, I have a thought when it comes to that trying to see if we can find a way to hold people accountable and hold their feet to the fire. With as much as politicians are paying attention to social media now, I think we need to start the hashtag no excuses GOP 2016. Absolutely. Because doing that does not mean you're being rude. I mean, to to stand their ground and to fight for what they were elected and put in office to fight for is not, that's not being unreasonable. That's not being outrageous. But what would be outrageous is to just pull the rug out from all the Democrats and just say, screw you. And we're going to, you know, knock you upside the head as hard as you tried to do it to us. And we're going to, you know, say just who cares about all of the Democrats that make up half of this country. Also, that's what Hillary Clinton did when she said, uh, you know, half of Republicans are my enemy. I mean, we'll never forget that. It was unforgivable and not responsible to say. So we can't be going to those levels, but we can absolutely hold our ground on what we think is right and what we think we should fight for. And there are no excuses. Yeah, but I mean, it's just, it's just time that we make them understand, you know, because they kept saying, you know, in 2010 and 2012, and now in 2016, they kept saying if we gave them a shot, they were going to do the things that they knew that a lot of the American people wanted. They don't have any excuses anymore because in January they have control of all they have control of all forms of the government. They can decide who the next Supreme Court justice is going to be, which I am honestly. If it was anyone else, I would be completely elated about. With Trump, I'm still kind of wondering if he's not going to pull out his sister and go, let's put her up there. But luckily, we retained the House and the Senate. So at least if he tries to do anything too crazy, I don't think they'll just immediately um, confirm whoever he sends up if it's somebody completely crazy. But who knows, because they have been pretty squishy lately. So I I can't really say. Yeah, but I do think that they're going to be they want to bring uh, Republicans that were and, and conservatives that were never Trump back into the fold. So I do think that they will try to. Um, in some ways, at least at the beginning, uh, kind of um, cooperate, coordinate. I can't think of the right word. Um, But yeah, just kind of kind of want to bring them back in and and we'll listen to um, things like that and not not go uh, full tilt the other way just yet. But I don't uh, who knows? I mean, I just can't predict with him. I just can't. That's the problem. All right, folks, well, believe it or not, we are officially out of time. Suicide Watch 2016 is going to continue when we roll over to America Off the Rails here in just a minute. Now back on its live new time, Sunday through Thursday, 11 p.m. Eastern. Also now available on crntalk.com on every Saturday and Sunday at 9 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Um, But as we do when we close out the show here, Miss Jen, why don't you remind folks where they can hang out with you when you're not on the radio hanging out with me? Sure. Come tell me how wrong I am uh, on Twitter at Jay Homestead um, and then Facebook and MisfitPolitics.Weebly.com. Please do, because I love watching how she owns the people that try to tell her she's wrong. It's so much fun. <laughs> All right. And I, of course, am AOTR underscore host on Twitter, and that is one of the best places to hang out with me. If you're old school, you can shoot me an email. You can do that at either ricky at the sparkradionetwork.com or rick at klnrradio.com, or you can hang out on the show's Facebook page uh, for the show that's about to start, America Off, America Off the Rails, or you can go find my professional Facebook page. That's uh, www.facebook.com forward slash rowdy ricky robinson. We will talk, we'll chat, we'll hang out, but no, unless you know me, you're not getting the one I use for friends and family. So don't ask. All right. So on that note, folks, we are out. I will be back with you live uh, here in just a minute on the America Off the Rails show. Um, And then, of course, we will be back live tomorrow night for Robinson and Wright. Don't forget, we have a guest coming on from the Federalist Coalition, a 501c4 uh, organization that just declared and uh, Fresh press release came out yesterday. Uh, Dan and I have actually been pretty intricately involved in that group, so we're kind of excited to see where it goes. Um, But we are on the way out the door. Again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And if you, like us, are really enjoying the liberal meltdown, I, I hate to say it, but we probably shouldn't be enjoying it quite as much as we are. But after eight years of feeling like we were the ones that were about to be extinct, it's kind of entertaining. I'm not going to lie. We're out, folks. Have a good night. My fellow Americans, ask not.
what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same.